You can see my slides? Absolutely, yep. So how many people are here? There are 16. Yep. Oh, cool. They cool. all made it back from reading week and there'll be more coming, yeah. So I'm not using the polling. Uh, thank you for making the effort to, uh, sure. to have it available, but uh, I don't think my brain is functioning properly to uh, <laughs> okay. think about it. That's fine. It was anyway. a good challenge for me. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and, and now you know it for next time. Um, so this is the third uh, part of the uh, lecture, uh, Promises and Perils of Artificial Intelligence. Um, so just to remind you, because it's been a while and you had a reading week, I hope you, you read quite a bit. <laughs> um, so um, we, we talked about the fact that uh, AI has been around for quite a while, now half a century, and uh, that there is a resurgence today. And why is it? Well, there are three factors. I talked about the, uh, the fact uh, of the, well, the, the abundance of data is one, uh, computer performance is another one, and new algorithms is a third one. So it's the combination that uh, is allowing AI to uh, come back to the spotlight. I also talked about uh, some applications, in particular in precision health. So precision medicine is the ability to classify individuals into uh, subpopulations that differ in their uh, susceptibility to a particular disease or in their response to uh, specific treatments. Um, and and uh, AI, in particular machine learning, can help us um, do prediction in this context and, and, and provide treatments for different people, despite the fact that they have the same symptoms. Um, we also talked about uh, many achievements uh, with AI, uh, starting with uh, Deep Blue in 97, with uh, uh, the problem with chess, also checkers, Chinook. Uh, we talked about uh, Watson, um, the self-driving cars, um, recently AlphaGo, uh, so incredible achievements. Um, we also talked about uh, the singularity, the technological singularity, and the fact that we can, well, in my view, there are uh, three, not four paths to the singularity, um, how to get something uh, uh, more intelligent than humans. You can actually help biology to have other humans more intelligent than the current humans. Or uh, the other path is the, the uh, uh, building the, a computer that is as intelligent or smarter than humans. Um, this is what most people think about. Um, but the other two paths, actually, I consider them uh, more plausible. One is the uh, cybernetic singularity, which is the mixture or the, the composition of, of humans and machines together. And the last one is, uh, there's a, some kind of intelligence that could uh, rise from the collective of interconnected smart objects, so the Internet of Things. Um, so why, why we are studying this uh, uh, AI or computational intelligence, actually, um, it's not only to build, um, and, I, and, I, and I mentioned AI as a, as a tool, it's not only to, to build new new solutions to, uh, uh, to have uh, a more better efficiency and better effectiveness, um, but is also to better understand the complexity of the human intelligence, because we still don't know how this incredible machine works. Um, and then that's what I think where we stopped last time. And I wanted to uh, uh, tell you something else and then we didn't have the time. I'll, I'll go over it very quickly today before uh, I start my, uh, my lecture. Um, in 1950, Alan Turing, who uh, worked during the Second World War on, on building a machine to decipher the, 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 the uh, enemy code from the Germans, after the war, he wrote an interesting uh, essay about intelligence and the, the, how these machines, now the computers will not be uh, used for deciphering code or calculating trajectories of missiles or whatever, but uh, for, for the 
common good. So how can we use these machines for the common good? And because he was working on deciphering code, he was actually thinking about thinking machines and machines that are intelligent. And he wrote this essay about um, computing intelligence with machines. And it's actually quite interesting because in that paper, he, he uh, uh, predicted many of the subfields of AI and even predicted the criticisms that people will have. And uh, something else quite interesting in that uh, essay, he talked about a test, a test to determine whether a machine is intelligent or not. He called it the imitation game. And so a, a, a machine would imitate a human and then uh, a judge would not be able to distinguish between the machine and, and a human. And he predicted that by uh, the year 2000, so 50 years after his uh, essay, um, he predicted that the machine would be able to uh, fool um, 30% of, uh, I mean, it has a 30% chance to fool a human uh, for five minutes, and the human would believe that uh, the machine is actually a human. And this led to um, this, this test that we call now the Turing test. Um, so you have a, a, a judge on one side uh, behind a curtain on a wall, and he's communicating with either a machine or human. He doesn't know, he or she doesn't know. The judge is... Uh, um, well, uh, blind to what's happening uh, behind the scene here. And if this judge doesn't know whether he's communicating with a machine or a human, and if it is a machine, then that machine is intelligent because it's um, smart enough to uh, fool the human that it is a machine, that it is a human. And um, very early, uh, already in 1966, there was a a chatbot. So this communication here is happening by text, of course, not by voice. And uh, um, in 1966, there was already a program done at MIT called ELISA uh, that pretended to be a doctor, a psychologist, actually, to help people um, talk about their issues. And it's uh, it, it, it was based on a few thousands of rules, handcrafted rules. Um, and, and a very simple program that looks at a, an input from a human. So the judge writes something. So in this particular case, a patient writes a sentence and then some keywords are identified. And these keywords would lead to some rules, we call them transformation rules that will transform a sentence into a response and send that sentence. If the keyword is not found, then a generic kind of a response is sent. And um, it was amazingly successful. I think it's the first program that um, uh, uh, fooled humans, so it actually passed the Turing test. Um, here's a, an example of that program. It was reprogrammed in 2005. And you can see here is an output. I got this from uh, Wikipedia. I mean, it looks uh, decent, but it's, uh, it's very uh, difficult to build because uh, they had to spend literally years to uh, um, come up with all these rules for different cases. And it's very specific to um, psychology. Um, but that led in the 90s, I think the late 90s, um, Hugh Lobner um, had this idea to start this competition uh, with, a, with a prize of $100,000 for the first program that would uh, fool humans. Um, they had three judges, so if uh, one third of them uh, uh, is fooled by, uh, for five minutes, then then they win. The program wins. And for many years, there were uh, programs that were competing at this uh, competition. And I'll show you some examples. This is uh, Jabberwocky that uh, uh, had uh, third place in 2003. So third place is actually first place because they didn't give a gold medal, they didn't give, give a silver medal, they gave a bronze medal directly. Um, so here's an example of uh, uh, a conversation with this chatbot, and it's just to show you that it's not easy, and it's actually quite uh, um, very easy to realize it's not a human. So here's the, the conversation. This is me talking to Jabberwack, Jabberwacky, 
I'm pretending to be Fred. And he said, no, it's not. Uh, do you mean I'm lying? I said, yes, I'm a very good liar. One of the best, in fact. And I said, yeah, but that doesn't mean I am the liar if you are a good one. And yes, it does. Why is that? I am God. Do you have a temple? So I'm trying to joke with uh, to, to uh, have fun with this uh, jabberwacking. And you can see that it's completely hallucinating. This is what we call actually hallucinating, confabulating. So it's, it fabricates a response without considering the history of the conversation. And it's uh, so in, in this box here, you can see that it's completely out of whack. I mean, it's, uh, it's not following the thread anymore. Um, let's see other examples. This uh, other examples. This is Alice. Alice was a, a winner for many, many years, um, and it starts very well in the beginning, but then afterwards, um, it's really dumb. And it's, these are all based on rules that uh, humans painstakingly uh, uh, came up with and put in the code. But you can see. Uh, here I'm talking about cold in Canada and says, no, I'm warm in California. So it's actually not bad at all. Um, but then I suddenly I ask it, hey, what's the best Chinese restaurant? And I think it's a Thai. Why is it a Thai? Why do I exist? I mean, it's completely out of whack. Uh, here's another example. This is a clever bot. Again, one of the best uh, contenders. Um, I'm not going to read the whole conversation, but you can uh, see it quickly here. And you can see that at the end, it's completely, it's evasive and trying to, uh, um, I mean, it doesn't follow the, the flow of the conversation. So the, the, the rules typically look at the previous utterance or the, the two previous utterances, but not the whole history of the conversation. Um, this is one that is very uh, uh, peculiar called Eugene Guzman. And Eugene Guzman finally won the $100,000. Um, and and they, they won it because they, 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 they use tricks. Actually, other, other uh, chatbots were using tricks to, to uh, pretend to be humans. Like, for example, intentionally putting spelling mistakes that people will, would would make by typing, uh, because then the judge would say, ah, that cannot be a machine if it makes mistakes. Um, so this one uh, used this trick by pretending to be a, a young boy and not even a, a young boy from the United States, but from Ukraine. So the judges should be indulgent when they see these uh, mistakes or grammar mistakes or things like that. Um, and they, they managed to fool um, one third of the judges, so 30% in five minutes and that's how they pass. So it's not really intelligent because it is based on rules that humans are writing and uh, because it's based on these tricks to fool. Uh, it's not really an imitation of the intelligence but it's basically based on fooling the, the judges. Um, now, actually we're surrounded by these uh, chatbots and very successful commercial applications but the difference here, these are what we call task-oriented uh, chatbots. It means that they have a particular task to, uh, to do, like for example, purchasing uh, uh, something for you, making a reservation in a restaurant, buying a ticket to a concert or things like that. There's, there's a very specific task. They identify the intent and based on that intent, they have a template um, and they fill that template. For example, you want to reserve a restaurant, uh, I mean, a, yeah, a table at a restaurant. They will have uh, specific questions like how many people, what kind of food, what time, and things like that. Um, um, but people are also working on open ended conversation uh, agent, conversational agent. Um, in my lab, we're working on one in particular. This is for companionship for the elderly, and I'll show you some examples of output. Uh, I mean, there is a, a, a cohesion in the in the conversation. Um, is another one. I mean, it's uh, you can see here, for example, it uses Canada because this person says, "I live in Canada," so we can still go back uh, quite far in the history of the conversation to to stay on topic. But I'll show you an example where it's actually to illustrate that it's not easy at all. 
um, here's an example where I'm actually telling a joke to Anna. I say, uh, two silkworms have a race, they ended up in a tie. And uh, uh, the thing that I have to say is that uh, to this uh, chatbot called Anna, we taught her to recognize nonsensical, nonsensical sentences and respond to these nonsensical sentences. And it backfired here because here it says, well, worms don't race. Um, and I say, well, it's a joke. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, uh, did you get it? Silk tie, but it answered some, some bizarre things. But so the, the humor is the most complex manifestation of intelligence for humans. And I don't know if animals can uh, um, have some kind of humor. Uh, probably some animals do, I'm not a specialist, but certainly humans are uh, very good at it. And uh, you need um, a very uh, specific intelligence to do that. Um, and sarcasm is, is even sometimes difficult for humans to, to understand. So I kept on uh, uh, um, conversing with this uh, Anna here and I said, uh, I will give you another one, meaning another joke. And it answered something that surprised me. Uh, people don't get sick if they give someone a second chance. I said, wow, that's great. So I give it the other joke. A dog gave birth to puppies near the road and was cited for littering. Um, that is so disgusting, it answered. And so why is that? So it didn't get the joke either. Um, and why is it disgusting? Because of littering on the road or because of giving birth? I have no idea. I didn't actually, uh, uh, it evaded the, the answer. Anyways, I wanted to show you this last time uh, because the Turing test is, a, is an important um, thing to know about. But I wanna continue now, um, well, the machine learning part. So remember machine learning is part of AI, which is part of computing science and within, so this is computing science, and then you have AI, and within AI, we have machine learning, and uh, within machine learning, we have uh, many different paradigms, among them um, supervised, supervised learning, and this is what I will be uh, focused on today. So supervised learning is a process that provides uh, an algorithmic means to learn from large data, uh, interpret the trends in the data, and hopefully adapt to the data. So I'll, I'll uh, explain that, uh, show you some um, concepts, and then I'll tell you about three different algorithms to do that, how computers learn. Um, possibly I'll talk about applications, even though we talked about the applications in, in the part two. So, um, I, I often use this analogy to explain how, how a computer learns. So imagine you have a pile of these um, balls, uh, different sizes, different colors, different textures, maybe different weights. And um, I have a, a set of buckets um, numbered one, two, three, four, five till N, and they have different colors. And I ask a child, the child is representing now the computer and the child is sitting next to me and I say, look, watch me and learn. And I'll grab a ball, I'll weigh it, I'll touch it, I'll look at it and then decide to put it in a particular bucket. Then I grab another ball, I do the same thing and then I put it in a different bucket. And I keep on doing that while the child is observing me. So the child is learning Learning what? Well, learning to distinguish between the ball that I put in the gray bucket and the ball that I put in the red bucket and the ball that I put in the blue bucket. And how did I make the decision to put them in different buckets? So if the child learned enough, it means that that child built some kind of model to discriminate between the different cases. And I'll tell the child, okay, now it's your turn. Here's a ball, put it in the right bucket, okay? So is it the weight that mattered? Is it the, the size, the color, the combination of the color and the texture, maybe the, the color and the weight? What, was the, what were the features that I used to decide which bucket 
to uh, put each ball, in, in which bucket to put each ball. And um, that's exactly what a computer does. So a computer, you give, you give it a set of data that is labeled, and I'm representing the labels here by colors. And this is what we call a training set. The program will run over this data and try to distinguish between the different classes and build a model. This is what we call a classification model. This classification model will be used to, I'll put a face here on it, will be used to predict the labels of other data sets or other, other records that haven't been labeled before. So I'll use that to label the data. So in other words, I'm, I'm learning to distinguish between the classes here. I am ad I'm adapting to this data. When I have new data, I can predict its, its classification. So how can I use this? Well, for example, um, the program can observe me how I delete my emails. So these are emails coming in. Some of them I read and I answer. The others I delete without even reading. And it goes over well, my behavior, basically. It observes me and it builds a classification model that distinguishes between spam and non-spam. Now, when I have new email, it'll label it for me automatically, labeling it, meaning it'll present the green ones and the red ones will be put automatically in the bin. Um, another example, I have images that have been annotated by a radiologist, a doctor. Um, this has cancer, this doesn't have cancer, and he's the region of interest and so forth. And I have a, a, an algorithm that can, can go over that, build a classification model, that uh, uh, will be used to automatically label new images. He, here's the case where you have uh, cancer and uh, these, this is normal, for example, okay? Um, now, it's not as easy as that. Of course, I'm, I'm showing you a classification from uh, 30,000 feet. Um, there are many, many uh, challenges, of course, when I have this data here, um, what are the features that matter, like, like those balls? Is it the weight? Is it the, the uh, texture? Is it the size? Is it the color of the ball? Um, identifying what are the features that are relevant is, or, or the combination of the features is not trivial. There are some techniques that uh, detect the features by themselves, while others we have to engineer those features and present them. Um, there's also a challenge how to uh, uh, um, use these features, discover these features and use them to build a, a good classification model, how to represent that model so that I can uh, use it efficiently and effectively uh, later to label these, these objects or predict their cl class automatically. Um, but this has been used in many, many applications. Um, you know about autonomous uh, vehicles, for example. How do you recognize the stop sign from the no left turn sign? Um, uh, how do you distinguish between a, a, a line to indicate the end of the road or the, 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 the different lanes on the highway and things like that? They all use machine learning. Um, another application is, um, What's going on with my machine? It's frozen. Oh, and that's not what I wanted to do. It's opening a website. No, okay. Uh, I clicked on one of the images and I didn't want to do that. Uh, so another application is, for example, recognizing the digits uh, when people handwrite the postal code or numbers on a check or things like that. Those are read automatically uh, by a machine and the machine needs to distinguish between a I don't know, a six and a B or this six and the other six, was it a two, was it a three? Um, we use machine learning to do that. And it, ha we, it has been around for a very long time, actually. Um, now it's more sophisticated. We can read even uh, uh, um, not just digits, but uh, uh, letters or even, even uh, formally in math. And you, you write it by hand and, and it's uh, automatically formatted uh, with the, uh, with a word processor, for example. Um, <clears throat> spam, I talked about it. Uh, credit cards, we use uh, machine learning to detect um, or label the, your transactions, whether this is fraudulent or not fraudulent. Is it yours or somebody else pretending to be you? 
um, in, the, in, in, the, in the financial market as well, the regulators uh, cannot possibly check every single transaction. Um, so uh, we have uh, machine learning uh, algorithms that uh, go through these uh, uh, transactions, especially the high frequency trading um, to identify possible uh, fraud. Um, recommender system, well, I, I mentioned before also about banks, uh, recommender systems uh, use that as well. Uh, adaptive interfaces, like uh, for people who are using uh, uh, social media like uh, Facebook, if you have a thousand friends, and believe me, there's some people who do that, have a thousand friends, you can't possibly see all the activities of a thousand friends. So Facebook chooses for you those that you will probably interact with. So it learns from your past uh, um, interaction, what did you like and what did you share and what did you respond to? It learns which articles have a high probability for you to interact with and will show you those instead of others. Um, there are also uh, um, adaptive uh, um, remote controls for the TV, it learns automatically which channels you like to watch, which ones you skip, and it will skip them automatically for you and so forth. Um, and of course, there are many applications in precision health. So how does it work? I think I showed you a slide like this. You have, you have a, a patient, a new patient. You have some information about that patient, but you want to predict something. For example, whether this disease will reoccur or not. Well, you can look at the history, the, the, the data from um, um, past patients, and you know for them that what you're trying to predict, whether it recurred or not, so you, and you know their characteristics, those features, well, you can build a classifier, you learn a classifier, you learn to predict this column based on this data, uh, and that classifier can be used for this novel patient to predict whether for them the disease will recur or not. Um, so the, it's not as easy as that, of course. There are many different characteristics of uh, 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 in, comp in, in machine learning. So the, we, we talk about uh, binary classification and multi-class classification. So multi-class classification is when your data, the, train, the training data, presents different possible classes. Like here, I have the green, I have the red, I have the gray, I have the two different blues. So uh, when I learn this classification model, it's a classification model for many classes. So I can predict uh, uh, many classes. The binary classification is when I have only two uh, and many problems are only two. For example, spam, non-spam. Uh, is it fraudulent transaction or non-fraudulent transaction? Um, is it cancer or no cancer? Uh, in this case, the classifier only has, has to do with two classes uh, only. Um, and many algorithms are designed for binary classification problem, but there are also many problems that require more than just two class labels. Um, also, once you learn your model and you have new objects that you want to predict, um, each one will get one label. This is what we call a single label classification. This is a red one, this is a green one, and so forth. But there are some applications where the, the, when you have these objects here, you want to label them, they may get more than just one label. Like for example, um, I don't know, different types of cancer. Uh, well, in this image, I may have two types of cancer, not just one. This one has only one type. Um, another example, I may try to predict the topics discussed in, a, in, a, in an email, for example. Um, well, in an email, I may have only one topic, but in another email, I may have three or four topics. So this is what we call a multi-label classification problem. Um, there are other interesting uh, um, facts as well, concepts. There is the notion of interpretability, and this is very important. Now we, we talk about explainable AI as a subfield in AI. When you have data for training and you learn a model, um, that model is often a black box. What does it mean? It means, yes, I can use this, this model to predict, but once it predicts something, 
I cannot ask it why, because if I ask it why, it can't, it, it can't tell me the reason why it predicted that particular uh, label. Uh, but some other uh, classification models, um, they learn a model, but the, learn, the model is transparent. So it's interpretable, but also explainable because it can tell me, oh, I predicted it's green because I have the feature A and the feature B. I can read it. It's a human readable, but you can even edit it in some cases. You can change it and inject your knowledge as an expert in the field, knowledge that wasn't represented in the training set. And uh, finally, there's another concept, very, very important as well, um, the notion of balance and imbalance in your data. When you give uh, data to the classifier to learn, um, often it is assumed that both classes, here I'm representing two classes, but I may have more classes, uh, the two classes are uh, evenly distributed. Um, so, and I, and I build a, a, cl a classification model out of that. But in many, many applications, actually in most applications, that is not the case. What you have, you have an, an imbalanced training set. It means that you have a majority class that can overshadow the minority class. And if you're not paying attention, your classifier will build a classification model that will, is biased by the green, the majority class. Okay, so uh, uh, we have to be very careful in our techniques to adjust to that. Um, okay, so what you need to remember is that uh, you have some data that is provided as input, which is labeled already. The learning generates a classification model. Then you have another phase, which we call uh, inference. You have a new or a new object or what we call evidence and the model that was learned before. And then we predict, what do we predict? Well, we predict the label of that object that was given as evidence, okay? So typically what happens is that <clears throat> we are given data that is labeled and that data is split into two pieces. So one big chunk of the data is what we will use to, uh, um, train, so this is the training data, and we'll uh, use an algorithm to create a, a model. And then we leave the other part here for testing. We will hide the labels. We'll ask the, the classifier, that the model that was learned by the classifier, this model to predict these labels. And we'll compare the labels that we hid with the labels that were predicted, and we will estimate an accuracy. And if the accuracy is good enough, then we will deploy it. What does it mean deploy it? It means now we will take new uh, objects that were not labeled and the classifier will label them for us. If the accuracy is not good enough, then we will have to uh, find another way to train. Either we, we get new data or uh, we use a different algorithm for training or we change the parameters and so forth. But this uh, estimation of the accuracy is extremely important. And what is the, the accuracy that is acceptable? Well, it depends upon the application. If my application is um, detecting spam from non-spam emails, well, what's the risk of making a mistake? Well, the cost is not that a big deal. I may lose some emails. That's good actually for me. Um, or I may, I may be annoyed by spam that uh, I wished I didn't see. Uh, it's not a big deal. However, if the classifier is about detecting cancer or no cancer, the consequences are high. I mean, I may, I may uh, tell a, a patient, hey, go home, you're fine, while well, they're actually dying. Or I may tell them, oh, uh, I need to now do a biopsy because you, I think you have cancer, while well, they don't. Uh, so there, there are uh, 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 huge consequences, and that's why the the accuracy in those cases have to, has to be extremely high. And, and when I'm trying to deploy an application to detect uh, uh, spam, if the accuracy is only in the 80%, for example, I'll be happy, I'll be satisfied. So this paradigm here of, um, well, this, this framework, let's call it, to take label data and split it in training and testing and, 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 and training on, the, on this training data and uh, doing this estimate, well, it has been used with many different uh, methods. 
Um, I will just focus on a few of them. Um, K nearest neighbors was very, very simple. Decision tree induction and neural networks. I may want to stop two seconds to see if there are any questions. Just a very quick question. Um, what are the typical accuracies that are required for like medical applications for AI? Wow, that's a, a, a difficult question. Um, there's no standard number that will not tell you. Um, but uh, uh, if it's not in the 90s, uh, nobody even talk, talks about it. So it has mm -hmm. to be extremely high. Uh, but is it 99? Is it 95? Is it 91? It depends. There are so many different applications in medicine. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have an answer for that particular question. But it has to be high. Uh, even though, even though uh, humans are not that high. Um, so, for example, in mammography, I was giving the example of mammography, there are studies to show that the accuracy uh, is not that high, especially for the new radiologists. Uh, the error rate can be uh, sometimes 12% or even 15%. So we're talking about 85% uh, accuracy. Um, so targeting the 90s is, is not bad. Uh, but doesn't mean that the humans are in the nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. That's fine. Good. Well, I'm I'm glad somebody asked me a question because uh, um, I learned yesterday that there was a, a a professor at the university in in Singapore, and after an hour and a half, he realized that he was on mute. And he couldn't hear anybody telling him that they couldn't hear him. They could, they were able to see him, but not, not hear him. So uh, there's evidence that you can hear me. That's good. So I will start by the um, the simplest um, classifier. This is so basically what I'm talking about now is how do we build this this cloud? I represented a cloud here. Um, how do we build it? So the simplest method is what we call the nearest neighbor, the simple nearest neighbor. Um, basically, I'll show it here uh, visually. So basically, you have your training data. And here I'm representing just two classes, but it can be with uh, many classes. And uh, I will not learn anything. Uh, this is what we call lazy learning. I'm not learning. I'll just put them next to me. I sort them maybe or something like that. And then when I have a new object that I need to label automatically, predict its label, so you see it doesn't have a color, I will use a function that looks at, so it's a distance function. It looks at the nearest neighbor in the set, nearest neighbor of what? Of this new object. So based on the features that I have here and as some distance function, I will see that the nearest object that I have among all these that I received for training is this blue one. Well, I'll assign its label to this new object so they'll say you are blue. Okay, That's a very simple, simple way of doing it. There's a, another one a little bit more complicated instead of using the uh, uh, nearest neighbor. I'll use the k nearest neighbors. So the five nearest neighbors or the 10 nearest neighbors or the 100 nearest neighbors or whatever k is. So now, same thing, I will leave my data set on the side here, they're all labeled. And when I have a new entity here that I need to classify, I will use the same uh, uh, function, distance function, but I will select the n or the k in this case, the k nearest neighbors. Uh, some of them are red, some of them are blue and they will vote. So it seems here that I have three of them are red and two of them are blue, then I'll give the red color to this new object. So I'm not learning anything, I'm just using a distance function that tells me the neighbors of this new object. Okay, there are a little bit more sophisticated approaches as well. We call them the weighted uh, uh, nearest neighbor because here they, they're all voting democratically. They all have one vote, but maybe uh, I can have a weighted vote as well uh, to select the color. There's also agglomerative kind of uh, nearest neighbors, uh, but they're all based on the same idea basically, okay? 
that's one approach. I'll show you another approach completely different where now the cloud exists because in the nearest neighbors, I didn't build any representation. I, I was lazy. I was just kept all my, my training data uh, next to me and I used the distance function. Now I'm gonna learn something. I'm going to learn a decision tree. So uh, uh, this has been around since the eighties. Um, the algorithm, the first algorithm is ID3. It was uh, uh, published by uh, Quinlan. And Quinlan, I'm using his example. He was, uh, um, um, he presented a data set here uh, where um, the class label here is play or don't play. I think it's negative or positive. Um, and it's, what is negative or positive? Basically, do I play tennis or I don't play tennis based on um, weather observation. So this is the past, this is the experience when it was sunny and the temperature is hot and the humidity is high and there was no wind, then uh, I, uh, I didn't play. When it's sunny, hot, high and the windy is true, yes, it was windy, I also didn't play. So here I put different colors for play and non-play to show the, 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 the classes. Um, and the, the problem is, can I predict, given some new observation of the temperature of today, for example, will I play or do not play based on the past? So we can build a decision tree like this. This decision tree summarizes all the information that exists in this data set. So what is this decision tree? The decision tree is basically a tree, it's an upside down tree, basically. This is the root here and the, the, the leaf nodes are on the bottom. Um, <clears throat> and each node in this, in this tree, the, 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 the blue squares are the nodes, it's a question on one of the attributes, the features here. And uh, each, uh, so the fan out, all these edges coming out, are possible values for that attribute. And at the end, the leaf nodes are the decisions basically. So how do you read this decision tree? You say, what is the outlook? If the outlook is sunny, oh, I can't decide. I have to check, is the humidity high or normal? If the humidity is high, then I will not play. If the humidity is normal, then I will play. But if the outlook here is overcast, then I will play regardless because you can see here, whenever I have overcast for outlook, it's gray, gray means play. Overcast, overcast, overcast. Um, but if the outlook is rain, then oh, I cannot decide. I have to see whether it's windy uh, or not windy, and then I will make a decision. So you can see that this decision tree summarizes all the knowledge that exists in the training data. And this is the cloud that I showed you. So this cloud or this data structure, this representation of the knowledge can be used to classify any new uh, observation of the weather, uh, classify meaning decide whether I will play or not play. The question is how do I build this decision tree? It's not the unique decision tree. There are many ways of coming up with a decision tree uh, from this data set, but there's one way that is systematic that can generate this automatically um, and, and something that is not too deep and not too wide and, and so forth. So the how is a, is a recursive algorithm, very simple algorithm uh, where um, you put all your data in one node. And uh, if, the data is all from the same class, then you label that node, it becomes a leaf node with that class. However, if the uh, uh, elements in that uh, node are from different classes, then you have to choose one attribute, or one, one feature, one attribute, and, and uh, split that uh, training data based on the values, the different values of that attribute. And then uh, when you split them, then you'll put them in all these different nodes. And same thing, if all the elements in that node are from the same class, then you stop and you label that 
uh, node with that class. Otherwise, you choose another attribute and split it again. You keep on doing it recursively. Um, the question is, how do you select the attribute? And there are different strategies. And the most uh, commonly known one is based on information gain. Um, and uh, uh, it, it, uh, it is deterministic. It always gives you the same tree and it's an efficient tree, not too deep, not too wide. And um, yeah, it's systematic. So finally, uh, so I'm showing you two completely different methods. One is lazy, nearest neighbors. This is decision trees. It gives you a representation as, as a data structure, a decision tree. Now I'll show you yet another method completely different. And this is based on, um, well, what we thought um, neur the, the, the neurons were, were doing uh, in, the, in the 50s. Um, the, the human brain or animal brains too have uh, an, an incredible number of neurons in the billions. Um, the also interesting thing, we, have, we don't have just one type of neuron, we have many types of neurons. And each neuron has thousands of connections to other neurons. Um, so they decided to, well, imitate more or less how a neuron functions, even though we don't know how it functions, but the rudimentary side of it. Um, and they build this artificial neuron. The artificial neuron receives connections from other neurons. Each connection has a weight on it because they have different strengths. Um, somehow the signals coming into the net to the neuron are summed up. There's a bias that can be added and then you have an activation function that decides, okay, I'll fire the message to the next neuron, next neuron or next neurons. Uh, so you have different layers of these uh, uh, neurons and they look like this. So you have one layer and then another layer, then another layer. They can be fully connected. It means that each neuron is connected to all the neurons of the next layer, or uh, they are connected selectively. And what happens is that um, in the beginning, when you start with a particular architecture um, with some layers, there's a, an input layer and there is an output layer and there, there are some hidden layers, we call them hidden layers in, inside. Um, in the beginning, each edge here has some random weight and you pass the information on the input layer. The information is propagated, the signal is propagated from one layer to the other until it reaches the output layer. And the output layer is supposedly predicting the, the, the uh, class label. But when you look at the class label that you have in your training data and the class label that is predicted here, if you see an error, you can back propagate fixing the error by adjusting these weights. And at the end, after training, after going through many, many um, examples, we call them epochs, actually many, uh, um, the same examples you go through them many times, the, the adjustments of these weights will converge to something that represents the knowledge that this uh, um, neural network has learned. Um, so it learns from examples, but I repeat them, repeat them, repeat them, and it learns these weights. These We call them parameters for the neural network. Um, yeah, so this is what explains a little bit more. Uh, these green ones are what we call the input layer. So I'll, 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 I'll uh, put my uh, training data here, the label I hide it, and propagate the messages up to here. The, the output layer will tell me the predicted uh, uh, label. I compare it with the correct label that I hid, which is the ground truth. And uh, uh, I adjust my weights going backwards, back propagation. So what's the difference between the real neural networks and these um, artificial neural networks? Well, uh, from the surface, they're very similar. Uh, we still are trying to understand how the uh, real neural network functions. But from what we understand so far, uh, they're very, very similar because uh, the cell 
um, receives messages from the dendrids. These are the messages that we, we get from this vector here with the weights. And here we have also different signals. Some are activating, some are inhibiting. Um, so we have different weights. Then at one point, this cell decides to send the message through the axon. And the same thing here, you have this activation function that sends the message. And that message goes to uh, many different other cells through these synapses. So uh, uh, by analogy, they're very, very similar. Um, <clears throat> okay, I think this is what I explained before. I will skip this. So the advantage of the artificial neural networks is that uh, they have an incredible um, accuracy. Uh, generally, the accuracy is very high. They're very robust to noise. Um, however, they take a very long time to learn. Um, the iterations can take a very long time and they require big machines with a lot of memory to be able to have the, that many that many parameters with all these layers and, and connections. And uh, so for a very long time, it wasn't easy to do, um, but now with the computers that we have, uh, it's uh, not only easier, but we can actually experiment with new architectures. Another criticism is that we can't easily open the box. It's a black box. So you, we can't really open the box and uh, uh, inject domain knowledge because domain knowledge would be I don't know, changing the parameters. The impact of changing the parameters is not something that we can control. The parameters are these uh, um, weights on the edges. Um, the consequences of changing something uh, is uh, not easy to control. And also how to design the architecture of that network, how many we put on the input layer, how many in the hidden layer, how many hidden layers whether it's a full connection or, or partial connection, or uh, it's an art, basically. It's not uh, trivial. OK. Um, now, deep learning, what we call deep learning today, which is part of the different techniques in uh, supervised learning, inherits all these positive and, and, and negative points. So what is this deep learning? It's, it's exactly the same thing, except that now we have uh, not just one hidden layer, because we have uh, uh, enough resources for the computers, we can have the luxury to add way more layers. That's what we call a deep. And we can um, experiment with way more complex architectures. And there are now uh, many architectures for different things. So in summary, um, supervised learning basically requires a training data set. So a training data set, it means these are objects that have been labeled, like the mammography labeled by doctors. Uh, you have an algorithm that goes over that and learns um, a model. That model can be a set of rules, can be this decision tree, for example, or can be a formula, a hyperplane cutting the search space, or can be a neural network. Um, the point is that once I learn that representation that summarizes what discriminates between the different classes, I can use that to uh, predict automatically the labels of unseen objects before. And I, 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 uh, when I have a, a good enough accuracy, then it, it can be deployed. And in many applications, actually, the accuracy surpasses um, the accuracy of human experts. Not in all applications, of course, but in, in, in many applications today. There you go. I don't know how much time I still have. Uh, I don't know what the time it is. Here it is 11 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> so I'm done. And no, if you have, have questions, uh, please send uh, them my way. 21 minutes for questions. Yeah, good, nice. good. So I'll go to put back my camera. Let me, I don't know what's happening here. Close this, close that, oops. Sorry, I have some problems here. Escape, oh, there you go. There we go. And okay. Stop sharing. Yay. <laughs> And put back the camera. I I have a
have a question. And first of all, thanks for staying up late to do this presentation. Um, no I know it isn't easy. I had a prof last semester who did synchronous classes at 2 a.m. in the morning at his time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, I just want to ask, uh, it, it's probably um, a complicated question with a complicated answer, but um, in what cases would you want the neuron, um, the neurons and like neural networks to be like connected to each other selectively versus to all? No, that's not an easy question to answer. Uh, and I said, uh, building the, the architecture of the, the neural network is, is an art more than a science. Um, if you have the luxury of um, a big computer with uh, infinite resources, you can connect everything. <laughs> um, you can even connect across uh, layers, not just from one layer to the other, but across layers. Um, but it's to minimize the number of edges that we decide to uh, not connect them all. Uh, but there are also algorithms that learn to sever some connections because some connections are, are not converging to something useful, they're not used. So when, when, once you build the network and once you have all these edges uh, uh, with weights and you're using it to predict, you can actually see how the messages are passing through the different paths. And then you can see some paths are not useful or some paths are actually contributing to mistakes, then you can sever them. Um, you don't do it manually, obviously, it's, it's done automatically, uh, but at the end, you don't have everything connected. So there are different reasons. One is because uh, we don't have all the resources to connect everything. And, and, and second, it's because, well, some of these connections are useless. And in, in our brain, um, we don't have every single neuron connected to every single other neuron. There are pathways. Um, and that's also what we're trying to simulate in these artificial neural networks. They, they, some of these paths will specialize in, in something while others specialize in something else. Mm -hmm. Okay, Does that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's like sort of just in terms of like efficiency. Or like yes. with humans, like if we sort of train our brains to do one thing, we're going to develop neural networks that, you know, help with that. Yeah, we we continuously, else. this is something we have in our brains. We continuously, uh, even though we lose neurons, we have less neurons than when we were kids, but we have way more connections. So we continue to develop new connections. Uh, when we learn new language, when we learn something else, when we learn a new dance or whatever, we, we, uh, uh, our brain creates new paths to connect some particular neurons with some other particular neurons. And uh, other connections disappear. They are severed. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Um, I have a question regarding that, uh, just an extension for that architecture question. Um, yes. So you mentioned pruning of neurons from the network to like, if they're not useful or just to improve the outputs. Um, I was wondering if there are architectures that would be adding neurons um, and like whether they choose yes. their own heuristic or parameters. So the reality is that um, the algorithms that learn to sever or add new connections or even add new neurons are very expensive. Um, so most of the algorithms that exist, uh, they rely on an architecture that has been designed already and they only learn new weights. So the weights are changing. Maybe the weight of, uh, of an edge will become zero. So it has no impact. Um, but it's not really severed. Th there are algorithms that sever the connections. There are algorithms that uh, may even add layers, but they're too expensive. So um, major the majority of existing alg algorithms today rely on an, on an architecture that has been given to it. It doesn't change much except the weights. And then the weights can be positive, can be zero, or can be negative. So some 
um, you have some inhibition as well. In addition to exciting one neuron, one neuron can excite the other neuron. You can also one have a one neuron inhibiting another neuron. Uh, so the the algorithms are mainly uh, working on changing those weights from from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay, and um, for pruning. Um, is that like the direction of research currently? Like you have a base, um, like a base set of neurons, just like how the human brain would operate. And, you know, as those connections strengthen or weaken, neurons are pruned essentially uh, in the training process. Uh, yes, yes and no. I mean, the, the algorithms that were pruning the connections and pruning n nodes and neurons and adding neurons, uh, are not new. They're from the early days of neural networks. Uh, today, with deep learning, they're not doing any severing. Uh, I mean, they don't, they don't cut anything anymore. As I said, they have the architecture done, and they focus only on, on the weight. So severing is basically putting a zero on the weight. Um, the, the, the research is more, I, I think, well, people are not spending too much time on that because it's a waste. It's better to focus on, on other things like uh, being able to have a more generic uh, neural network um, because the, this connection that you are trying to sever for this particular task can be actually useful for another task. And if you wanna have a generic neural network that can do different things, so why cutting it physically? Okay, I see. Just to bounce off that, so would a, gener a generic neural network like require, you know, more input neurons, like more layers? Yeah, so in the early days of neural networks, the, um, the input layer was well-defined, it was part of the design of the neural network. Um, and so, for example, I showed you the case of playing or non-playing uh, tennis. I have attributes like outlook, uh, humidity, uh, temperature, and things like that. Those features from my input data will tell me how many neurons I need in my input layer. Okay, so the features were decided by the engineer who engineered the architecture. Today, actually, it's not the case anymore. Today, you have the, the input is a huge vector of ones and zeros, and you take anything, it can be an image, it can be text, it can be anything, and you put it in, and the features like uh, I decided that it's the outlook or the temperature or whatever that will decide that I will play or not play. But today, actually, I leave it up to the neural network to decide what are the features that matter. And the features are not necessarily outlook or a temperature or whatever. It can be a combination of those that are um, concentrations within the, the network itself. So I put the whole thing in, so the, the, the input layer is very large, many, many, many ones and zeros. And then after a few iterations, I will see that part of the network will light up, if I may use that term, it will light up uh, uh, when uh, uh, there is the case of playing or not playing. Um, I forgot exactly what the question was. It's about how you decide about the input uh, you 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 were asking about the input layer. Yeah, just like um, what like differences are there for more general neural networks, right? Like yeah. So because exactly. So because now I don't have to decide about the features. The features are learned by themselves. I can have a generic input. It's a very large input layer. I can put anything in there, and it will learn. So I can give it text and about uh, medicine, for example, uh, uh, it learns from text uh, that I extract from um, uh, uh, 
medical records, what, what the doctor wrote. So with that kind of vocabulary, but then later I can use text from Twitter and text from a novel, text from it doesn't really matter anymore because I'm not uh, tied by the kind of input that I will give it. It can take anything. Uh, I can give it images and these images can be images of cats or images of dogs or images of digits, nine, six, seven, whatever. Uh, so they are generic in that sense. Because we have the luxury today, we have the luxury to, to have very big networks. In the past, we could not. And that's why we limited them to the engineered features that somebody decided. It's outlook, it's temperature, it is humidity, and so forth. Um, other questions? If no one else, I, I do have another question. Um, I was wondering uh, if we could simulate like a macro scale communication system in memory between neurons. So uh, like, I, I guess an example um, with long short term memory cells, uh, you, you have individual neurons, I guess, having memory and it's sequential, but there isn't too, too much like communication between all the neurons within themselves, like kind of mimicking how hormones would affect biological neurons. Um, I guess the question is like, is there a potential benefit for that design, um, especially in terms of like developing a gen uh, like a general intelligence algorithm? Yeah, yeah there, there are many, many uh, uh, attempts to uh, come up with uh, some other, uh, other ways of, um, what, what I explained is very high level. So what I explained is uh, uh, really 30,000 feet, uh, but there are many different ways of doing things, even how to decide that the neuron will, uh, uh, um, so the activation function, how to decide to send a message or not. The, and, and all these neurons are the same. In other words, they have the same activation function, but uh, people are thinking about having different specialized layers and different specialized neurons. And some have memory, some don't have memory. Some may even learn when to activate rather than have a, a specific function. They may learn by themselves when to activate, when not to activate. So yeah, there are so many different uh, complications people wanna add to see how they can simulate this or simulate that once we learn about how the brain functions. Um, yeah, I can't cover them all, of course, but there, there are many different attempts indeed in terms of uh, like what you mentioned, the uh, LSTMs. Um, that's one, one, one example. Yeah, I guess the ultimate uh, limiting factor has still been uh, processing power. It seems like a lot of these ideas have been limited by, by just like how much computation is required exponentially more. Definitely. And, and uh, I don't know if I mentioned it in the first lecture, um, our brain uses just uh, 12, 12 amps is nothing, uh, just a light bulb. When you look at what the computer uses to uh, train these neural networks, it's phenomenal, the energy that they use. Um, it's, it's actually, there's, there's now a, a research about how to reduce the energy used by these neural networks, but uh, uh, some of them, I mean, some, some of these models like uh, in uh, natural language processing, we build uh, language models with neural networks. Um, some of them to build cost millions of dollars with uh, millions of machines running at the same time. It's, it's, we are still far away from what the capabilities of the human brain or even an animal brain. Um, the scale is uh, completely different. So yes, we are limited by uh, scalability to try different things, but we're moving forward to, to uh, uh, every day there's new papers talking about new techniques, adding this and adding that. Eventually we'll, we'll find a way, um, but I'm, I'm more excited. Um, I mean, we are, we are learning about how also our neurons are functioning 
just by studying how the artificial neural networks, uh, the different alternatives of artificial neural networks, where we are, we are speculating on how the brain is functioning. Thank you. So any other questions? I, I should have recorded myself and sent you this rather than waiting till this time. <laughs> <laughs> that that would be it. very spontaneous, though. I know, I know. This, this is this is better responding to actual questions rather than the questions you predict might be asked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My classifier for questions is not very good. <laughs> yes, yes. Anyway, yeah. Oh, this has been a great teaching session. Thank you very much for staying up late for us. And um, we look forward to interacting more once you're back in Canada. So, yes. and uh, Patrick will be lecturing on Thursday. So, yeah. Cool. That's cool. Yeah. 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 He has a completely different style. <laughs> That's true. Okay. So thank, thank you. you very much. Stay safe, guys. Right. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a good night. Good night. Bye. Thank you.